Some dare call it conspiracy. Welcome to the Some Dare Call It Conspiracy podcast, hosted by Brent Lee and Neil Sanders. After nearly 20 years exploring the world of conspiracy culture, we are taking our guests and listeners on a guided tour of the rabbit hole. Our mission, to discover where the truth lies. Hello, initiates. We have a little bonus episode for you today. A few weeks back, Neil and I were delighted to be interviewed by Soz and Sandy of the Tinfoil Tales podcast. This was a great chat, and we both highly recommend you go and follow their show. I'll leave a link in the description. Now, take it away, Soz and Sandy. Yeah, so just to introduce everybody here, uh, we have got um, the boys have joined us over from the UK. Where about are you at the moment? Yeah, so I'm Brent Lee, and I'm from Bristol, and Neil is up in Nottingham. Bristol and Nottingham. I have no idea where they are. Sauce may know more. She was from it, that it, way. Originally. And Nottingham's right in the centre. It's, uh, it's where Robin Hood came from. So Kevin Pussner. Uh, from that. <laughs> there we go. And I'm from Bristol, where Banksy comes from, so that's a little bit better than not, than Robin Hood. <laughs> she claimed that, but I don't know who it is. Right? <laughs> okay. Oh, you, you've got massive attack as well. Yeah, massive attack, tricky. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Ronnie size. Oh, all right, you win. Very good. So, I'm going to kick off with the first question. And my first question to either or or both of you is, what was your conspiracy pipeline? So, if you think about when you were first just mildly curious about something, to full blown in there, lizard people, chemtrails, all of it. Like, how long did that journey actually take? You know, is it months? Is it years? Oh, um, not long actually, because sort of. Um, I have a tendency to like get obsessed with things and I, I found a couple of things and, you know, became obsessed with them. The first thing that I, I really found was, um, Chris, who, uh, everybody knows from the show, his granddad had got this DVD that was Ed Begley Jr. Uh, somewhere in New York doing a presentation about how he was doubtful yeah. about 9-11. Um, and, um, so I, I, just, I watched that and was fascinated by it because it was like, just like, I, I, I you know, I was aware of like, Waco and yeah. um, 9-11 and, uh, sorry, not 9-11, um, a JFK and things like that. But this this 9-11 thing just absolutely blew my mind. So very quickly after that, I discovered eBay. And on eBay, there was um, numerous people that had um, conspiracy DVD shops. And if you bought one for about three pounds, they'd send you dozens and dozens and dozens. And so all of a sudden, you you just opened up to just, all sorts of crazy wackiness. And I think pretty early on as well, we found the Bohemian Grove, the Alex Jones thing. Um, and it's an interesting thing. We were talking on a space the other day, right? And this chap called Poker of Politics said something that was really, really insightful. So that once you take something on board like JFK or Bohemian Grove and take it at face value, it alters the baseline of what you... Um, what you considered the government capable of doing. So, like, if you think that, like, oh, the government definitely killed JFK, which isn't completely unreasonable, but basically once you think that, then the idea that they might kill 3,000 people at 9-11 or, 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 or whatever, like, um, it's not beyond belief. And, and that's just a really interesting point because, like, the second that you, you, you take the Alex Jones thing on board, that, oh, they're doing satanic rituals in the woods and stuff like that, it completely skews your perspective, basically. Um, so it doesn't take long for you to become sort of really fascinated in in, in all the weird stuff um, and uh, and really search it out. Yeah, same for me. Same for me. It was a nine eleven truth or documentary that opened me up to the the wider community of conspiracism. Mm. Um, I was always kind of intrigued. 
interested in like unsolved mysteries TV show and like the Roswell stuff or JFK, um, maybe even John Lennon, like being mm. killed by the CIA or something. I was always kind of interested in that stuff, but it's nothing that actually like defined my belief. You know, it didn't define my worldview or change yeah. change my life in any way. But the minute I started watching nine eleven truth or documentaries, everything changed because I just yeah. thought, okay, America has literally just killed three thousand citizens mm. it, on on one on one day, and they're blaming it on people who who hadn't done it. You know, and so the pipeline for me starts there, and I start kind of looking into well, who are these people? And I keep hearing this stuff about. Uh, George Bush and John Kerry being in the Skull and Bones. Well, what's the Skull and yep. Bones? What is all this? And so it kind of starts opening me, opening me up to secret societies and Freemasons, Rosicrucians, Skull and Bones, etc. And that just was like started me like f- fumbling down the rabbit hole essentially. And I just would kind of be open to almost anything. Then I'm just open to yeah, at least entertain whatever ideas were going around do did you, you ever watch the um oh sorry um do you think, do just... you think it's quicker now like do you think like if you think about your journey and like people that you might have known pre-covid and post-covid do you think that post-covid to accept all of it is quicker so you go yeah. from yeah. covid's a scam to all of it in a very short period of time yeah, yeah, totally. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily anything to even do with COVID. COVID's kind of the, um, uh, yeah, it's the subject, really. But it is the social media. That's the thing that's different. Now we've got TikTok videos, we've got memes, we've got all this stuff, which just make people change their minds instantly. You know, we were saying recently, like, both me and Neil, we had to, like, buy physical books. We had to get DVDs. We had to endure eight-hour lectures to like actually soak this stuff up today you can literally see people just making their mind up and basing their worldview on a few tiktok videos because other people are sharing them so you get this kind of uh, you know they they act like they don't believe in the consensus but they're following a consensus of like their friends or their community that are sharing these specific little videos so i think that's what it really is there used to be a lot of longer ones as well, didn't there, Brent? Like, you remember the Chris yeah. Everard Illuminati film? That was one. Oh, yeah, really, yeah. Like a four-part, like, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 totally. So all his sorts of films, they, they were quite high production values, um, but they were feature length. Uh, and then Alex Jones's films like Road to Tyranny and stuff like that, uh, Police yeah. State, they, they, they were long films, so like two hours and stuff like that. But as you say, nowadays, people can just watch a sort of 10, 15-second TikTok and that that's all that they need really um but yeah so so a yeah, good example a good example of like this is like the wayfair conspiracy theory like that yeah. went around on yeah. tiktok and places like that and it just became viral and so many people started to believe it like so quickly without really having invested any kind of time into it well, the social media gives you immediate access to like hundreds and hundreds of people that agree with you. Like, as you said, when we were doing it, we're sending off for videos on eBay and then sort of nervously telling your friends, oh, I thought this thing about lizards, you know, and hoping that they don't like walk away and <laughs> shaking their head. Now, whatever your theory is, you can find a like minded community within seconds that are going to go, oh, yeah, no, not only is that true, but even wackier shit is even truer. And so you don't have to convince people. Like, you, it used to be quite difficult. Like, you know, here you go, read this entire book by Jim Keith to get my perspective. Uh, and, you know, you, you don't need to do that anymore uh, because th- there's people that will give you the, the highlights. Mm. Mm. And when. When you like were on the journey, when you were on your journey, uh, did you find, and maybe this again might be impacted by social media, but like at what point do you think that your family or your friends or, or your workmates started to go, oh, like what the fuck's going on? What's going on here? Like, did any, like, do you remember like, that point where you could sense your friends kind of going, oh shit, what's happening? Oh, uh, that was going on for years before and anyway, so. 
Um, no, no, not really. Uh, it, well, actually, kind of. It was at work for me where all of a sudden somebody introduced me as the guy that will tell you about all the Illuminati and stuff like that. And it suddenly struck me that, shit, um, that's all I talk about. There was also um, a friend of mine that I sort of got into these through sort of Alex Jones DVDs and stuff like that. And I didn't see him for a couple of weeks. And I came back and bumped into him. And he just downloaded at me, oh, this symbolism. And did you see this on the telly? And did you see that? And I, I went, oh, my Christ, is that what I'm like? Um, and so that, that sort of, uh, that, that was an instance with me where I was like, oh, I perhaps need to rein this in a little bit. I didn't, but at least I had the, uh, sort of, you know, uh, wherewithal <laughs> to notice it. Yeah. My friends were, and um, family, like when I came to, uh, my entry point, like with nine eleven, I don't think they were too shocked about what I was really saying. They just like, just disagreed. Yeah. But then, like, when it comes to, like, say, the secret societies, the Freemasons, or, like, what Neil brought up earlier, like, the Bohemian Grove video, that really convinced me that those people were evil and doing occult shit. Yeah. So if I tried to, like, share that with friends, like, they were kind of definitely would look at me like, are you mad? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, you just haven't seen these videos, guys. You need to see what these people are doing. Like, honestly. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like did you find that frustrating like i often wonder like how frustrating it must be when you're like to that point where you do think there's grooming and the trans agenda and all that kind of stuff and like you're yeah. trying to explain it to your family and friends and they're just like shut up like they don't see the danger like that must be like incredibly frustrating it is incredibly frustrating but i also had to just like accept that um, well, maybe they're just not ready to be awake yet. You know, uh, there's, like, there's only so much because this is what we used to speak to each other on the on the forums. On like, I used to be on the David Ike forum, and we'd have like a um a thread on there, like how to talk to people, how to talk to your friends and family. Can we wake them up? And there was always kind of this consensus amongst us all, like, well, maybe it's just not their time yet. You know, and when it is their time, we'll be there for them. But it's incredibly frustrating trying to get people to understand that you you think that this very very bad thing is going on this 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 the world is run by these evil people and they're committing crimes against humanity like you can understand that like even with the like anti-vax and anti-covid movements today like they are venomous and rabid because they think that like the governments or bill gates or the wf or whatever is trying to killer and we're just like looking at them going what are you talking about you're you're being ridiculous but they believe it so hard so i can understand the frustration that have been there if we're being completely honest um and i'm sure brent will agree with you, to a to a degree uh that also sort of feeds into it you know the idea that basically no one else believes you and we're sort of like we're, we're like a minority fighting to get the truth out that kind of Sort of feeds into the uh, the fantasy of being a freedom fighter, being a truth teller, and stuff like that. And to a degree, that becomes enjoyable because it it makes you be separate from the norms, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely it's so participatory. Like, I can see the draw of that. You know, like I can see that you think that you are this digital warrior sitting at home you know, trying to find that little thing that someone hasn't seen yet that you can then add into the mix. And, you know, you see it on Telegram, like someone will share something and everyone congratulates that person. And like, that must be, that must make people feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very. And quite, quite quickly as well. You know, you can, um, you can get, get like a big hit within the scene or whatever. And like, you know, people will all of a sudden start sending you messages telling you how brilliant you are and such like that. And, and mm -hmm. it can snowball quite quickly. Like, um, particularly again, particularly nowadays, if you do a video or something that says something, I mean, look at all the sort of the people that took advantage of COVID and whatnot, like that dreadful woman, Louise Hampton and stuff like that, you know, clearly lying yeah. through their teeth and whatnot, but they said what, what people wanted to hear at that particular time uh, and and that's why it got lapped up basically 
I mean, you've probably got some good experience with this because of your books on mind control and MK Ultra. Like, yeah. like, cause I always, I knew of you, like when I was a truther because of these books, you know, like everyone was kind of like, oh, this is the definitive guide to MK Ultra. This proves that the people are doing like mm. mind control. Um, so yeah. you must have surely got quite a lot of like praise off of people when you first came out with that. Oh, yeah, yeah. The first time I went to like a conference or whatever, I had like people coming up to me and asking for autographs. Fucking wow. Autographs. Like, you think, I know, it's mental, isn't it? I'll tell you something mental. This is slightly silly. Um, because I kept getting asked for my autograph and because people wanted me to autograph books and stuff, I have two signatures, one which is my normal signature and one which is my autograph signature, which, uh, staying out loud, isn't quite as cool as it sounded in my head. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah that was a, a thing that i had to do so uh, so yeah this is the point you do get um uh you do get praise and stuff like that and it, it invites you into a community as well very very quickly you've mm. got you're surrounded by people i remember the first time that i bumped into people like nick Collistrom, for example and i was like i've seen him on the telly by which i meant rich planet tv like do you know what i mean but but he's but but you know what I mean? They're, these are like people that you admire or that yeah. you've heard of. Like I met remember meeting Lloyd Pye and thinking, "Wow, this is incredible! This guy's like, you know, really up there with all the sort of modern thinkers and whatnot." So the the whole aspect does does feed into it. It is a bit weird at the minute because it's a bit nasty. Like it, it used to be the point where basically everybody was quite sort of like, "Come on in and look. What's your theory?" Okay, that's a bit. I oh, don't quite agree with that, but let's pop it on the, you know, uh, on the shelf with all the others. <laughs> now it's very sort of factional, like um, arguing over who is the most vaccine injured, or if you don't believe this, or if you don't think that the earth is flat, then you can't yeah. be trusted, or if you don't. And it's all sort of like, hmm, this is all getting a quite overtly cult like. Well, interesting, because Sandy had a, had a question about exactly that. Sandy, here's your cult moment. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, we were just talking earlier. Um, I remember in one of your podcast episodes, I've listened to a whole bunch of them. I can't remember, I can't, can't even go back to the one that was. But basically, you started explaining how this is like a cult, but it, there's no leader. But could you talk to us about, like, is this a cult or is it a cult-like thing what what do you see that's going on absolutely well, well i think i you know it's not a uh, it's not a cult as in the sense of like a commune or something like that but it's very similar to it and i think one one of the things it does like it's an ideology so it's a cult-like ideology this is how i kind of explain it from from where i was maybe neil wasn't quite as ideologically based as i was with it um, but this, this is my own experience and yeah, I, like I said, I, I tend to call it a cult like ideology. And the thing that it kind of promotes, instead of having a cult leader, you have these, you have cult recruiters and, and these mm. are the, the speakers and the influencers and people like that, that, that are out there, like the David Ikes and the Alex Joneses. Some people will try and say that they're the leaders, but they're not. They're the ones that are trying to indoctrinate you into this ideology the thing that is different to any other sort of cult is that it makes you the leader your search for the truth is the leader and what it does is it it tells you the, the key is here do your own research you know yeah. so it puts you at the center and you are the one that's the leader and it makes you feel like you're free because you're the one walking through this path on your own but you've got this community behind you as well. And you're all like these, essentially like you're all your own cult leaders wow. and you're all in this cult together. That's how I, I see it. But, you know, some uh, academics don't think it's a, a cult at all, but others do think it's very cult-like. Mm. We do have I mean, some, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Neil. Well, I was just going to say that, like, the way that it's slightly slanted as well, although, like, uh, there is a huge thing, like, oh, we have no leaders, we we don't sort of, like, eulogise anybody and stuff like that. But on the other hand, it is David Icke stood on the stage in front of you for eight hours and you have just paid him 50 quid to, to watch him. And 
the course material that you end up researching just so happens to be his book. So, you know what I mean? So, so in some ways, th- th- there's subtle slantings towards, towards the sort of uh, uh, mechanisms of a cult, basically. What it does, though, is it, and, and this is a sort of cult thing, but, it, but this is ubiquitous. It gives you a place in the world. It tells you what, what happens in the world, and it tells you your position in the world, and it tells you that you've got like-minded people who will psychologically support you. So basically, like, you know, if you're a flat earther, like, you know, oh, brilliant. I know exactly what the world is. That makes it far less complicated. And because I, um, you know, I'm Eric Dubé, so I'm top of the tree. And I, uh, and I also know what the world is like. So, so it works kind of like that. But to be fair, so does advertising. So does owning, like, Nike shoes or whatever, like, or having a Mercedes or anything like that, because they're sort of, they're, emblems of where you are socially uh that are bound up in a sort of idea about what is important in life basically so that's that's kind of what it offers you it's also like you said before like um being a a super fan of a band yeah yeah that is very much still it's all you know it's like we call those sorts of like a cult-like following yeah yeah Yeah, no totally totally yeah you like you like somebody that's got like I don't just follow the bands. I go to every single gig and I've got their logo tattooed on my chest. Like it's, yeah, it's a bit like that. Yeah, that makes sense. That's actually, yeah. We have recognised possibly in our, I, I, I'll have to maybe speak to you further on this, but uh, we have recognised that, Soss and I have recognised maybe there's, we've got three cult leaders that are kind of coming out of all of this where they do appear to be forming like this cult thing <laughs> but um mm. yeah and for for our listeners who jumped on here uh, they probably already know who we're talking about but like hoodie bosey and darren bergworth who are really like they're forming cults but anyway <laughs> um yeah so that that was my question yeah about that one so thank you very much for answering that one so if you got any more yeah questions? of course <laughs> um can i just add on there like there is obviously like there are sub cults that form around this that yeah. use conspiracism as a, at the end of the day like most cults are like pushing some sort of grand conspiracy you know there, there's mm. there is a tie-in there together it's where the cult thing ends and where the business model starts though isn't it yeah. like, you know what i mean it's like i mean you could make the argument that alex jones has got a cult thing going on because everybody's buying these stupid pills and all these prepper food and all of that sort of stuff. And in order to do that, you've got to sort of be indoctrinated into the concept that, oh, the new world order's coming any second. Like, you know, <laughs> it's all going to go west and stuff like that. But at what point, I suppose, I suppose the distinction is like who, would, who believes it and who, um, if you had to sort of rank them or whatever, I'd put Alex Jones more as a sort of crooked businessman that utilizes ideas of, of the cult. And then I'd put David Icke more as a sort of wannabe cult leader that utilizes aspects of the conspiracy business model <laughs> or yeah. something like that. So, like, I, I think although money is vital to both of them and, and although sort of idolization is vital to both of them, I think that David errs more on that he wants people to think he's brilliant. Alex doesn't give a shit. He just wants your money. Yeah. Yeah, which was a little bit what we were talking about earlier is this – internal cult like feeling you know where you you think someone's got the best idea and that's the pair that's almost your ride or die is the way that it's set itself up here like generally you know ricardo bosi doesn't like graham hood so therefore all of the people who follow bosi won't listen to anything that graham hood says <laughs> but i think what i saw during the recent voice referendum was that they have become a useful base of people for more nefarious people to leverage, you know, and whether that be mining or uh, whatever, the, you know, for us, it was obviously the voice referendum. They tried to say it was, you know, someone started saturating the market with it was a UN takeover. And then all of a sudden, they all were energized. And probably the most active all on one thing, and we're actually pretty successful at doing it. 
but none of it was their own idea. You know what I mean? It's like people above, 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 right at the top going, oh, shit, we don't want this. This is the last thing we want. Indigenous rights. What if they say they want the mining land back? Got to shut that down. Oh, uh, is that what it was about? Okay, that makes sense. I didn't I would realize that. But yeah, they, they kind of, they, they can be utilized like sort of like football hooligans. Like, you know, yeah. like, you know, your local teams will fight or whatever. But if it's an international, you'll put all that aside for this <laughs> yeah. greater good. And that's what we saw with COVID as well. Like, what was bizarre in the sort of, in, in America, all the COVID protests were put on by this think tank by, called the Heritage Foundation, like, which is essentially, ironically, could be described as the deep state because it's yeah. full of people like, you know, Mike Pence and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, Mike Flynn and, uh, half of Donald Trump's, um, ca- uh, cabinet and, uh, the oil industry, Coke brothers and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, in the UK, um, a lot of the, the, um, protests were put on by the Church of Scientology in conjunction with this racist far right sort of quasi political group called the, um, uh, what they call the English Democrats. And so, the, but this is the, the, the problem is that basically when you get too involved in any of these ideologies, I mean, and again, it doesn't necessarily sort of just, I mean, the football aspect is another one. You can be manipulated by somebody uh, ooh, higher up the pyramid, so to speak. So, um, yeah, and, and that is that is the problem is because basically a lot of people come to this with this sort of righteous anger. It might be completely misdirected, but they are, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to sort of make a change. Um, and if you've got that sort of ideology behind you that, look, this is important and this is the, uh, the right thing to do, even if it isn't, you can really motivate people to be dangerous. I mean, the, the, the best example of that is would be something like January 6th, but it yeah. sounds like you're getting a, a sort of like examples of that in Australia as well. Well, we did have the burning of the doors at Old Parliament House. That was probably yeah. the that was probably the closest that 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 we got. Um, well, the doors of the building on fire. Yeah, yeah, old oh. Parliament House. But that was more of a pseudo legal sob sit thing. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, we've got like there's a huge common law thing here. You know, like common law is it's been around here for a very long time, and it used to be very yeah. much on the fringes, but it's becoming more and more and more mainstream, like all of the the groups, you know, like there, there'll always be that moment where common law kind of steps in and they all want to be sheriffs and um, yeah. I don't consent and all that kind of stuff. So that there's, mm-hmm. yeah, we have a lot of that, <laughs> a lot of that. It just, you know, the, the thing that gets me about the common law is like, it should be really straightforward. It's like, uh, you, you tell me that there's some blah, 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 blah. If I say X, Y, and Z, it'll get me out of a traffic ticket. It's like, wow, that sounds fascinating. Can you show me a single example where it's worked? <laughs> like, and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I've got a friend that's a copper, and um, he he sometimes gets, well, I've got two examples. I used to work for a power company, yeah. And uh, you know that thing where people send in the bills and they write on it, this has already been paid by the blah, blah, yeah, blah. The of it. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's a whole group in the billing department of this company that I used to work for where they just collect those up and laugh at them and post them straight to the bailiffs. Like, so it doesn't work. And I've got a copper friend, and um, he was saying, yeah, we sometimes get these uh, twats, like, asking, are you standing on your oath, blah, 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 yeah. and all of it. And I That's said, does fine. it work? Is, is, is there any combination of words that work? He says, no, in fact, it'll just get me cross enough that I'll hit you with my truncheon. I love it. That's my specialized subject. Like if there was a mastermind, <laughs> mine would be the straw man. I, I yeah, me and my straw man. <laughs> oh, it's dreadful. Like I, I wouldn't, I've spoken about this before. There was once a case that I knew quite a prominent um, UK sort of sitter, and he was, um, uh, yeah, and I, I won't name it, but basically convinced this lad on a very minor charge to tell the judge that. He wants him, you know, that's a straw man, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Uh, and the judge went, oh, this poor son doesn't know that he's a real human being and banged him up in um, a psychiatric hospital where, unfortunately, he had a very, very poor reaction to some of the drugs that they gave him, and he died. Wow. Yeah. We've actually, and that- got, we've actually got a lot of that going on now. We've got a lot of people 
you know, that have really been sucked into this belief of the magic words and, you know, you just need to ask them, you know, yeah, this, you're not in your right jurisdiction. What did you say? Mm. Growth to the Queen of Australia doesn't exist. All this kind of <laughs> stuff. And we've got more and more people now, stories that we see on Telegram of people being arrested now, you know, like in the court, they're getting taken away, they're getting put on psychiatric holds. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually, it's it's a bit disturbing, actually, when you, you just the frequency of it. But sorry, it, that's my specialized subject. Sorry, Sandy, you go, you go. No, I was just going to say. All night. No, no, no. I was just going to say we have the red ensign flag in our um in our logo there as well, which is their flag that they've taken on. It's it's supposed to. Oh gosh. Oh, explain it, Sandy. Oh, explain God. the flag. <laughs> <laughs> it's just nonsense. But anyway, that's their flag, the six pointed flag. It's a long story. Trust me. We'll be here for another <laughs> hour. Um, but yeah, no, that's yeah. yeah. Sauce is really interested in that. It's really quite interesting. What's, the thing that gets me about that is that, you know, the first series and, and Unsolved Mysteries, they all sort of run alongside the concept of um, corrupt policing or whatever. For example, like, you know, certain police elements covering up stuff in, say, JFK or or, or whatever, like, you know, fights in Quentin Pro that, against the Black Panthers, that that type of thing. So so there's this sort of through line of the police are corrupt or the, or an element of the police or, or want the police state or something like that. So how does that work alongside with, you know, you know, they're desperately corrupt, they will kill you, unless you say the right combination of words in the right order, in which case, you know, it stops them like that fucking thing that he does in Crocodile Dundee. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fit for me. Yeah, my, favorite, I- my favorite word of them all that they all say is inner stand. They yeah. won't say understand because that means that you stand if you're under. standing under. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. they say right. inner stand rather than, yeah, I love it. I love it. And then, but the well, way yeah. they get away with it, because, yeah, no, it doesn't work, but they all they, they come up with different iterations of it. And then they say that if it didn't work for you, you didn't do it right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like our, the main guy um, is this guy called Wayne Glue. And, um, he has been, he's been constitutional expert, <laughs> common law, yeah. whatever, for years and years and years. He lost his house. He lives in a van. Like, they- <laughs> <laughs> and they still- this is always the case. There's a very famous one in, 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 that was in Nottingham. I forget the guy's name. He wore a, a white, um, hat and he got sort of swept under the sort of wing of all these things. And it was about not paying his mortgage. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and in the end, he just, he lost his house. Um, and they, they were doing huge sort of like, you know, we're stood outside protesting and the police just turned up and said, no, mate, sorry. I can't remember the guy's name, but again, he's not, it's not, um, unique. These loads. In fact, there's, uh, who's that stupid woman in Canada at the minute? I think she's the queen The like all of her supporters are finding that they're having the, the uh, queen. That's it. So the doula, yeah. Thing, like, oh, the doula. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. That is <laughs> like like some some weird old ladies just turned up. I'm queen of this place now, and, and people have gone. We actually that's do reasonable. Have... Yeah, you know that's that's satisfying. Like it, she, we actually she seems to have, have a... an alternate king. In oh yeah, his, yeah name's, his name's King Stephen, and I am a big King Stephen fan. He What's believes... Greg Hallett got to say about that? He believes that the the crown was vacated when they introduced the imperial crown, and so right. he declared himself King Stephen of Australia. And there's actually people who have in Australia who have sworn allegiance to King Stephen. They actually wow. have to take an oath. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think that. Joel was talking them. about this. I, I think Joel was talking about him at some point on our recent episode. Yeah, I love him, Stephen. King Stephen, Stephen Spires, Stephen Spears, as we call him. But yeah, like, right. anyway, I've I've diverted away. Sorry, I took you down a common law path. It's my favourite thing. Oh, oh, I can stand the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, there's a new rabbit hole. <laughs> I did. One thing that I did want to ask about, um, just to get serious for a second, was I, I noticed the other day some horrible AI generated. 
uh, winning back Britain, getting Britain back something. Um, oh, yeah. That old mate Tommy Robinson, I'm assuming, is behind. Um, uh, probably him or someone like Paul Golding or that Jada Friend, what's mm-hmm. her name? There's, there's a lot of horrible far-right shit going on in the UK at the minute. Yeah, and I, I'd like to understand, like, how that's working from a language point of view because I think that one thing that maybe people who in Australia in particular who are part of the freedom movement may not Mm -hmm. understand that some of the language that they hear and some of the language that they then say is actually a little bit coded language far right and they probably just don't even understand so like how do you think that has worked its way into this whole freedom space I mean, well, I mean, it's been going on for a long, long time, actually. Like uh, about sort of 10 years ago, there was a massive resurgence in Holocaust denial. Um, There was a film that came out called um, The Greatest Story Never Told that was basically telling you how Hitler was probably really hard done to. Um, And then there was um, uh, Project Europa uh, and a resurgence of this concept of the Great Replacement Theory and this idea of something called the Kalergi Plan. And basically what all of these things are is ideas that um, people in Europe want to get rid of the white race. Um, And the the most ironic thing is this this is a classic example of people not doing their own research because they keep talking about this thing called the Kalergi plug. Um, And um, the uh, Kudendorf something um, medal. And they they framed this guy. uh, He wrote a book, uh, I think it was called Pan Europa, and they frame him as like a sort of, uh, well, the frame is Jewish, and they also frame as wanting to destroy um, all the borders in Europe and basically uh, create a sort of mixed race where there's no uh, no people of color, no white people, nothing. And this is to essentially eradicate white people. And the irony is, if anybody would actually have read his book, they'll find out that he's actually a white supremacist that felt that black people were uh, not human, uh, and he wanted to. Um, he wanted to enslave Africa because he felt that the, the African people were animals and used them as slaves to make Europe a great, white, prosperous Christian nation. Um, and the um, Kulogi Kunlov Award that people get so bent out of shape about, um, the, the, it was awarded to um, Angela Merkel. Uh, I mean, she didn't accept it, but they awarded her one year. And so that was enough evidence for people to say, well, this is it, isn't it? This is the new world order. That particular organization, um, on their website, it says that we want to put a, um, a wall around the edge of um, um, Europe. We want to ex- deport all Muslims and make uh, Europe a, a solely white Christian uh, endeavor. And so, so these things that they're actually sort of portraying as being sort of examples of, uh, of um, uh, you know, wanting to destroy the white race are actually sort of white supremacist things, which is... Fabulously ironic, basically, but um, but yeah, it's 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 complicated. It was a lot to do with Brexit and to do with yeah. the rise of Breitbart, which was essentially set up in the UK to um, promote the UKIP um, uh, uh, political party, which was at the time run by Nigel Farage. Yeah, it, it, it it's a sort of a cross contamination of certain oil interests and certain large corporate interests and private healthcare um, that's connected to far right elements of the Conservative Party, essentially in the, in the UK. And the, the long and short of it was that they wanted to utilize Brexit in order to privatize UK healthcare and to introduce a load of sort of American insurance based sort of firms. Unfortunately, what happened was. Donald Trump lost the election and Biden realized that basically uh, the problem with Brexit is it, it, it ignores something called the Good Friday Agreement in, in Ireland. Now, yeah. again, this is very, very complicated, but the long and short of it is we stole bits of Ireland years and years ago and we don't want to give them back for whatever reason. But because <laughs> of that, you've got two trade zones on the same, um, take the same sort of land mass. Uh, and so they don't really know what to do about the border. And the, the problem is that essentially, to, to, to use um, a sort of uh, an example that the Brexiteers would hate, I could quite happily walk. I could come from uh, anywhere in Europe to Ireland because it's in the EU and I could happily walk across the border into the Northern Ireland and then I'm in the UK. So I can then get to the UK. So essentially there's an open border there yeah. that nobody can stop. 
and this this problem has never actually been sort of reconciled really but so because of that they needed to change people's um sort of perspectives and so they used ideas such as immigration and uh it was mainly immigration, if we're really honest. <laughs> like, um, uh, use immigration and, and lies about sort of rape gangs and grooming gangs and things like this to sort of just build up this um, uh, this idea that, that basically people were being attacked. And then the, the, what they've quite cleverly done as well is they've appealed to people by with the argument of free speech, like saying that, oh, if you say this, they'll throw you in jail. This is quite clever Stuart Lee joke, but if you... They will literally throw you in jail if you just mention that you happen to be English nowadays. And it's like, mm, well, they, well, will they? But like, and so a lot of the, a lot of the ideas through free speech are sort of they're, they're what's called a Martin Bailey argument. Basically, they'll say something that's perfectly acceptable, like "I'm proud to be British." It's like, fine, that's okay. And they'll pretend that they're being persecuted about that, and they're not being persecuted about that. They're being persecuted to the point where their pride becomes couched in extreme nationalism, xenophobia. Uh, the idea of an idealized white Christian past and the idea that basically anybody that doesn't conform to that stereotype is not included in the concept of Britishness. Mm. Um, and, and so, so it's, it's quite complicated. You've got a lot of, um, levels to it. You've got people at the top connected to sort of corporations and, and political organizations. And as you trickle down, you've got sort of essentially useful idiots. You've got some people like your sort of Katie Hopkins and Tommy Robinson that, are sort of sat in the middle just being rabble rousers. And then you've got idiots like your people like Leilani Dowdings and your right said Freds and your Matt Letitiers. And then you've got a load of people that are just sort of desperately trying to get attention like idiots like Jackie Devoy and people like that that are repeating tropes that have trickled down from the top. And they don't examine them because they're not particularly bright. Um, and so basically they don't realise that they're or don't care that what they're actually espousing is is far right propaganda a lot of the time. We've started like the the you know there is this absolute rich thread now of you know at a minimum we need to halt immigration is kind of you know what some people are saying you know like this cost of living crisis we should halt immigration until people here are sorted out. You know, so you can uh, definitely see the start of that, which, like, you know, like, I watch what goes on at, across Europe, and it's like, wow, like, the rise of the right in Europe is actually pretty scary, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you can see it, it's like, you know, you've got, you've got Gert Wilders in Holland, you've got, um, uh, so name Maloney in um, Italy, you've got Victor Orban, uh, a lot of people sort of pa- were sort of pandering to, to Putin and, and things like that as well. It, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it was a plan essentially that Steve Bannon started, um, and it's just going through its sort of different iterations. As I think, I think his initial plan sort of failed. He was with um, oh, uh, Matteo, um, oh, the guy from Italy whose name escapes me, the, the bearded bloke, um, and um, and uh, yeah, like that was the sort of point that they were trying to sort of introduce sort of this concept of popularism and right wing. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very, it's very, very strange because I think initially their sort of push fails, but then a lot of other people or politicians and stuff like that realize that actually, you know, there's a, there's an audience that's rabid for this and they're very loud. And then, then you get, we get into things like sort of like, you know, GB news, obviously Sky News in Australia has been very, very sort of right leaning and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, and the irony as well, it's just that like, you know, people go like, uh, they're the only ones that tell the truth. And it's like, what, really? Like, I mean, GB News is run by a person that, that's like connected to the Legatum think tank, you know, big industry. Sky News is Rupert Murdoch. Like, yeah. I don't know whether, and, and that's what annoyed me about a lot of the things, like, is that all of a sudden, the conspiracy world is willing to overlook certain things or like, you know, contradict itself essentially because that's the flavor of the month. And it's like, mm, it doesn't really work like that. And is that how you think that both of you started to kind of scratch your heads and start questioning some of the stuff? Was that it did feel like that there was some things that were getting given a free pass and other things weren't? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, Brent, do you want to tell your, your story first, man? Yeah, well, my story more 
the, b- before I do that, I just want to say like the, the immigration thing as well. Like it's, a, it's such a distraction. Like these people are distracting us from the real problems. Like the people ruining the, our country are not coming in on dinghies. They're coming on yachts at the end of the day, you know? Um, yeah. but why, yeah, what I saw was I saw politics in a different way was, is kind of what started to bring me out. Um, like I had always thought that politicians and leaders were selected, not elected. And with like Brexit, um, Trump, it kind of just like completely contradicted what I had been thinking for the 15 years, pretty much that I was in, you know, um, for example, with Trump, um, Hillary was like always the top elite. Like she was the person that they were priming to be the first female president. She was literally the establishment and Trump was like the outsider. So I I just figured, okay, it's definitely going to be Hillary. But through social media and all this, I was actually able to see kind of um, how people were intending to vote or how they were being swayed to vote for different things. And it kind of actually brought me out of the idea that democracy was just a game that we were playing. It wasn't something that we were actually voting for. Right. And seeing that happen, like seeing Trump actually become elected because of like people being essentially manipulated into voting for him. Mm. And the same exact same thing happened with Brexit. Like Brexit did not make sense to a conspiracy theorist because again, if the elections are rigged, right? Why on earth would England leave the European Union, which the European Union is a stepping stone to the one world government. Yeah. You know, so like if you're a truther and you believed, say, in democracy, like, yeah, that would be a win. That would be us be breaking the new world order apart or something. But to me, the, the elections were rigged no matter what. But again, I could see everything kind of unfolding on social media. That's, that is kind of the good thing about social media. You can connect with like actual real people all across and you can kind of gauge the temperature of what's going on. Um, and, and those are the things that really like it started to break apart the political aspect of my conspiracy beliefs. Cause you're right. Cause I mean, Hillary should have won. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is like what I could see at that time was. The people that did win, say Trump and the Farage and Boris Johnson kind of camps that were behind Brexit, I also noticed that they were all leaning in on conspiracism. Mm. They were essentially trying to recruit the conspiracy movement. And I felt like that was that was very strange. Like Nigel Farage turning up on um, Alex Jones' show, talking about the New World Order. Like that was just kind of mind blowing to me. I was like, what's going on here? Cause I know this guy's a terrible human being. He's a terrible racist. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't agree with this guy. Yeah. You know? mm. And also having to accept that Trump was the leader, because again, that immediately went against absolutely everything that, that you've been told for the last however many years. Like you can't mm. trust him because he's a billionaire. You can't trust him because he's vaguely related to the royal family. You can't trust him because of basically all this stuff that he did with the mafia and his past uh, racism and his father's connections to the John Birch Society and the Ku Klux Klan and stuff like that. And everyone just went, yeah, no, that's all right. And it's, and it's bizarre. <laughs> because, like, you know, I, I mean, they're doing it again at the minute, like uh, with Elon Musk um, and uh, Alex Jones sure. massively pandering to Elon Musk. And bizarrely, the only one that's actually sort of sticking to his guns or, or doing what he should do uh, is uh, David I. The only problem is that he's, he's doing it in such a way that is so obviously sort of based in jealousy as opposed to doing, in inverted commas, the right thing. Um, that he can't stand that ever, anyone doesn't listen to him, essentially, is, is the problem. But yeah, it's like the, as Brent said, none of that was supposed to happen. Like Trump wasn't supposed to get elected. Brexit wasn't supposed to to happen. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't supposed to be 
uh, uh, put forward to say. Or, and yeah, there, there's numerous things, uh, basically. With, with me, it was a sort of chipping away of it. Um, actually chatting with people in the industry. Like the first thing that sort of really got my sort of back up was I was doing a Rich Planet show with Richard D. Hall, the chap behind the Manchester thing. And, um, he, um, uh, for no good reason at all, brought up, so, Neil, what do you think about the trans agenda? What do you think about the, you know, the plot to use trans people to destroy the family unit? Isn't it weird? Isn't it freaky? And I was like, no, I don't think there is an agenda. I think there are just trans people. And I think that, like, I think the exact thing that I said is the thing. I'm, I'm baffled by how much time people spend worrying about other people's genitals. Like, I give a shit, to be quite honest. And we sort of had an argument, and uh, it culminated in me saying something along the lines of, Richard, do you want to transition? No. Is there anything that I could say, anything at all, that could persuade you to transition? No. Then what the fuck are you worried about, right? Okay, why do you think that everyone else is, like, like uh, can, can be persuaded to, to do whatever they want to themselves, like, just by sort of, hey, this is cool, kids. Why don't you do this, kids? It's like, mm, t- no, it's just not going to happen. And um, the next thing I fell out with somebody about on a radio show was about paedophile hunters, because I suggested that actually it's not really a good idea because it tends to sort of victimize the wrong people. It gives the wrong impression of who it is that's actually uh, uh, committing these crimes. A lot of them don't go to trial because they, they've been brought around badly. Uh, often people are persecuted um, wrongly. Uh, and most of the time, surprisingly, all these paedophile hunters are ex-racist National Front people and football hooligans that are desperately trying to sort of rehabilitate their image. And it, and it was used, again, as a pipeline to, you know, it's, again, it's that Mott and Bailey thing. Nobody could argue with wanting to lock up paedophiles. But the problem is that the next stage is, you'll notice a lot of these paedophiles are Muslim, aren't they? But actually, it's the Jews. Or oh, something stupid like this. Yeah. And so... Like, there's all that, that nonsense. And then the final straw with me was twofold. One was COVID, because basically everybody was just being absolutely stupid with that. Like, they, they decided before anything had happened what, what was going to be the narrative. And the amount of mental gymnastics that were encouraged, I mean, they got to the point where basically, like, to explain the deaths, they have to now say that, oh, no, there was no COVID. They're all murdered by doctors and nurses who gave them, like, sedatives to kill them. It's like... Really? Like, Pamela from across the road is now a mass murderer, is she? Because she seems really nice to me. That's strange. Like, and um, climate change as well. Because I've basically noticed that um, everybody that comes out against climate change has two things in common. One, they're not actually qualified to be making statements. They're usually like geologists, like Willie Soon or something like that. Or if they are qualified, like Judith Curry, they're intimately financed by the um, Heartlands Institute or the fossil fuel industry. And so I was putting it to people in the conspiracy world. It says, look, let, let's, let's pretend that this was a medicine because I know you hate medicines. If somebody came out, basically said, I'm not a doctor, but I suggest that you should buy this, this vaccine. Oh, and by the way, I'm paid by Pfizer. You'd throw that out immediately, regardless of whether it was um, you know, good to do that or not. Yeah. And you're not applying that same scrutiny to this because it suits your agenda that the green agenda is some sort of tyranny. It's uh, actually and- funny because we had a called Reckless Renewables rally up in Canberra yeah, uh, maybe five or six weeks ago, and a whole bunch of politicians all appeared to speak. So we did a bit of an ex- uh, episode on it, and we actually yeah. looked at their – our register of interests and it was Uh exactly the same thing it's like oh so like this one's speaking and they have shares in mining and this one's speaking and they have accepted uh flights and accommodation and an racv club membership that was paid for by the mining industry and we actually said if this was fauci you'd be calling this gain of function exactly yeah i mean this is the thing the amount of like conspiracy theories if you track it back actually benefit the oil industry is mm. actually is bizarre and it's one of those things where it's like look this is everything that you're supposed to be rallying against and it's the it, and it's, it's it's strange because there's almost like a willing amnesia about it because 
I watch people. I watch Gareth Ike, right? Okay, literally <laughs> look at a paper that said COVID exists, and he did this sort of weird little shake in his head as if he was wiping it from his memory, and we never spoke of it again. <laughs> And he was like, right, so that's that's what we're doing now, is it? We're ignoring reality because this is this sells better. And that again, that that's fine if you're talking about the moon being a spaceship or the queen being a lizard or anything that's really not going to affect people's lives. But yeah. you know, when you're encouraging people, like what happened was essentially um, a friend of mine, his his sister's uh, not particularly well, and um, uh, She's a huge fan of David Icke and she put herself into really dangerous situations uh, because she refused to mask up or get a vaccine or believe that COVID was real. And she was one of these people where if she'd have caught it, she could have very easily died. Wow. Uh, and at that point, I was like, this is this is ridiculous. Like, you know, for for praise on the Internet, you're going to tell people stuff right. that not only is harmful, but if we're honest, I think, you know, is harmful. And you've decided to to do that anyway because it benefits you, um, and and but it only benefits him in the way where basically I am so clever. Look, I am so smart, and it's like, is it really worth? It? Is that really worth it? Like I, yeah, couldn't live with myself to be quite honest. Mm. I think Sandy, you've had some questions about how to deal with like friends or family who are maybe still in there. Yeah, um, I wanted to come in tonight. Um, one of my pressing um, questions, it's a bit of a two-parter, but basically, um, you know, with us having doing this podcast over the last couple of years, um, we how do get people that reach out to us who are friends and families of some of the subjects that we've talked about or they've reached out to us and said that they've got a friend or a loved one who is down the rabbit hole. And they often come to us for like advice and we don't know what to say to them. Um, what I wanted to, uh, to ask you guys, um, especially uh, Brent, I know you came out of the rabbit hole, um, well, both of you, actually both of you, sorry, but what was it that your friends and family did that you appreciated as you were coming back out of the rabbit hole? you could then pass along some ideas to people who are listening right now. So my friends and family, well, my family, like one of the things they never did was cut me off. They never, like, they they would never try to argue with me or any of that kind of thing, you know. But to be fair, they didn't know how to. They didn't understand the topics. They didn't understand what I was really talking about. So they just would never you know, never be able to engage with me or whatever, but they also never cut me off, you know, um, which, which you do see a lot. Now you do see a lot of people like completely falling out with each other because they just are so polarized. Um, but yeah, the thing I would really try and say is like, no matter what someone like, just think of it as if they, they, they've joined a new political party or they've joined a new religion or something. You wouldn't cut them off for that. You know, even if you didn't believe the same sort of thing. And what I would really say is it's just like, try and keep them close, no matter what. Like, if you want, if, if you don't understand the topics that they're talking about, then just ask, like, can we talk about something else? Because it, can we just like talk about the game or can we talk about whatever it is that you guys are interested in? Um, but the, th the other thing is, like, if you do have that time and you do have that energy and the will to actually engage with them, like, do it, do it with, with kindness, do it with respect because you have a relationship with this person. They love you. They respect you. You love them. You respect them, you know, and, and you should always tell them that, like, don't, hey, we might disagree on something, but don't forget, like, we've loved each other for 20 years you know i would die for you you know remind them of that and that this isn't something that we should fall out about um and what you really 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 need to do is actually understand what it is they believe understand why they believe it which is kind of what we're trying to do with our podcast obviously you know we're trying to show you the bones of a conspiracy theory and well, that's kind of what Neil's doing with his research. And then I pipe in and try and explain 
why that might be believable to people. And you need to understand those two things if you're going to engage with them. Because if you don't understand why it's believable, not just why it's wrong, but why someone would believe that, then you're not going to really be able to mm. pull them out, essentially. Um, but you, those are the things I feel like you need to do. You need to understand the conspiracy. You need to understand why, they, why it's believable, but also then understand why it's wrong. Mm. And if you can kind of have those conversations with them, you don't have to take apart the whole Jenga tower today. You know, just try and pull one Jenga tower out. Like just, let's say, just go for chemtrails. You don't have to go through the WEF or the whole conspiracy, um, all of their beliefs or anything. Just like tackle, say, one subject that you might be interested in. Um, because you're not going to change their mind completely today. Like I've got a friend myself who is like as as conspiratorial as I was. Like he's been down that rabbit hole for many many years, and like I have no chance of pulling him out of the full conspiracism just yet. But with one conversation, I did pull out the chemtrail Jenga tower. You know, that, that Jenga block, just by being able to answer some of the questions that he had, now he's kind of like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe it isn't that they're spraying, you know, chemicals on us to depopulate the world or whatever. And yeah, actually, pollution's a really bad thing. So that's obviously what's just going on. That's, that's the trails that I see. It's just pollution. And I can be angry at that instead of being angry about something that they're not actually doing. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and, um, just what helped for me, um, was to sort of reframe. Um, I mean, we don't really debunk, but we sort of like deep dive, so to speak. And often it ends up debunking, but, uh, you get a certain rush out of, uh, conspiracy theories, like get into that understanding and get into that sort of place where you say, Oh, that's why this happened or whatever. So what we try and do with the podcast is we, we can, we're giving you the same thing basically like but it but it's like the next level of it so rather than understanding the conspiracy theory it's understanding where the conspiracy came from and why the conspiracy came out and why certain people would want you to believe that so it's so it's almost like the conspiracy behind the conspiracy uh, and in that way we're sort of offering people the same i don't know dopamine hit or whatever the same uh gratification from solving a puzzle that they actually got from um, from being involved in in conspiracies, basically. So, so there's that, and and also uh, we do acknowledge that um, conspiracies do happen. Like you know, rich people conspire, crimes happen, espionage happens. There's corporate crimes. There's all those sorts of things. But potentially, there is a conspiracy. The conspiracy theories are there to stop you looking at the real conspiracy theories. If that makes sense, like you know what I mean. Whilst you're sort of bothering looking to see uh if um you know is the queen a lizard we're totally ignoring banking scandals and embezzlement of public funds and uh uh lobbying organizations and stuff like that the greatest example of that is the bohemian grove where essentially like there are problems or the world economic forum where there are problems with both of those organizations in as much as basically large corporations get access to politicians in, in behind the scenes talks that we will never fi- fully know what, what's happened there. And, and in such a way, they can spread influence um, in a way that sort of goes outside of the normal democratic process. But what it isn't is Satanism or world communism. And so this is the problem that they, they probably love that. If you think of it from a conspiratorial mindset, if I was the World Economic Forum, I'd love it that everyone thought that we were a satanic organization that was trying to install world communism. Because you know what else you're moaning about that? We're getting away with all the stuff that we actually do, which is basically getting our projects done and getting kickbacks from the government and making huge amounts of money and actually causing environmental damage whilst pretending that we give a shit. Uh, and so it, it, that if you can put, frame these things like this, People are still on the hunt, if you know what I mean. You're still doing the sort of the same, the same uh, investigative work that you were doing in inverted commas um, when you were looking for conspiracy theories. Now, just to go back to your original point, 
about whether your friends and family um, uh, were like uh, trying to get you out of it or whatever. <laughs> Weirdly, my friend, a friend of mine came up to me the other day and went, look, I, I do like your podcast now, so I think you're really, really good and whatnot, but you don't trust the government, do you? It's like, no, of course I don't trust the government. I'm not that, yeah, I've not gone that far the opposite direction. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. It is really what they think, though. Like, we get that a lot, like, in comments. Mm. It's like, oh, but I bet you, you trust the government. And it's like, no. <laughs> no, like, no, no, we don't so, yeah. trust the government, actually. And we were probably not trusting the government long before you realized the governments weren't to be trusted. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. So like I, Sandy and, has got an absolute cracker of a question, and I'll get her to ask it, and then we might wind it up because I'm very conscious that you two have probably got a million things to do, and it's the start of your day. But Sandy has a very good question. Okay, yes. Yeah, so um, the final, well, I guess, yeah, the final question is, so Sos and I have spent the last few years um really deep inside their, uh, here in Australia, we've been really deep inside their echo chambers. Um, that We often get told, you watch mainstream media, stop watching the news. Like, we're not watching the news. We're actually um, spend more time in watching you and what you have to say um, and mm-hmm. listening to all your views. Um, why is it that me and Soth are not pilled? Like, how come we're not getting pilled? Why, what is in what's happening? What's the predisposition? Well, it's, it's got nothing to offer you. Like, I mean, if if you look at the sort of things that pill people and stuff like that, um, it, it's it's some type of explanation as to would be one or two things, right? One, an explanation as to why your life isn't perhaps going the way that it might go, and two, a sort of clarification or solidification of 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 an existential threat. Because, like, you know, I don't want to come across as all John Paul Sartre, right? Okay. But, like, you know, that, that is a sort of concept of, of human reality, this idea of being worried about outside influences and people sort of getting at you or, or whatever and the, the fragility of life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, we're complicated beings and all these sorts of traumas and, uh, and concerns can be um, channeled into something that basically, it uh, isn't necessarily the answer, but it provides you with a psychological answer. Like, it's the Illuminati. That's why we're going to war. That's why this is happening. That's why X, Y is happening and stuff like that. But if you're in a position where basically, frankly, you don't care about that, because, I mean, I'll put it this way, right? Okay. Uh, I noticed recently when t- having a chat with Joel, actually, and sort of going back and examining getting out of it, there was a correlation between me being happier and more satisfied in life and work, et cetera, et cetera, and not needing conspiracy theories anymore to fill a gap. Yeah. yeah. So, so it could be, it could be that. And I'm not saying that, that that's always the case, obviously, because, you know, people get, people get into conspiracies primarily because they're fun. Like you wouldn't do it if you didn't get some sort of enjoyment out of it. Now, off the back of that, people tend, can tend to sort of like incorporate it into their own identity or something and give themselves a purpose or whatnot. But so I suppose, and this is highly speculative, but, but it may well be that basically because you didn't need that, you had a purpose or you were perfectly um, comfortable in your position or, you know, in yourself and didn't feel the need to sort of have some sort of talisman hanging around your neck that says, look, this is what I do as a, as a person. Hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. I would say, um, I know we were joking about don't trust, we don't trust the government or whatever, but I would say you, both of you must at least have some sorts of trust in institutions in some sort yeah. of, some sort of yeah. demarcation line that I didn't have. Like, you know, yeah. For, let me go back to the beginning of again where I where I fell into the nine eleven rabbit hole. It was all it was two thousand three, and we were on the cusp of war with Iraq, and yeah. everyone's saying like the world the weapons of mass destruction thing is a lie, and so I'm coming at this thinking like I really don't trust the governments at all, and I'm seeing in the press that they're actually pushing this same thing, and but the UN is saying it's not true. So I'm looking at the media thinking, well, all of you guys are lying. Everything, this is, this is all 
super, super corrupt. Everyone's lying about this thing, and we all know that it's not true. And I joined protest marches here in, in England, and there was millions of us on the street protesting about this weapons of mass destruction thing. And mm. this is when I came across the 9-11 stuff. And it showed me that Bush, yeah. like basically, and, and the neocons had set up 9-11 to do this thing. So because I was in this very, very untrustworthy stage of my life, very yeah. anti-government, anti-war, all of that, it really fed into that for me. And like with the difference between, say, the COVID um, era of conspiracism is a lot of people that don't fall down that hole is because they do have a trust in the institutions of, say, medicine and science. You know, you can, you might still have that distrust in the, the media or in the government, but science is the thing that backs this up to say that this is not, these conspiracies about this is not true. You know, and I yeah, think having some sort of some sort of trust still in an institution yeah. is like yeah, that's super healthy. But mm -hmm. you should, but obviously, it's it's um it's whether or not you're you're you have a little bit of trust or a lot of trust or yeah. like you, these things can become super exaggerated. Mm -hmm. But I think that's possibly why a lot of people didn't like fall into the rabbit hole here because of like the trust in science, the trust yeah. in the institution of that consensus. Yeah, that yeah. that's actually, yeah, spot on. I, I reckon, yeah, trust in the medical system. That was for me because I'm in the medical system. And so for me, I was like, I, I, I could see they made mistakes along the way and I saw those mistakes. But um, overall, um, I felt that, yeah, they took a, a good response. They're responding to a, a real threat that I saw and I was, yeah, quite happy. So then when, um, when these people were saying that COVID wasn't real from the start, I was like, well, I already know you're wrong. <laughs> so everything yeah. else he said after that is wrong. But well, it's the introduction of nuance as well, isn't it? Because that was always the thing like um, with the COVID. It's like, so you're saying that you agree with, with the lockdown? Yes, in principle. So are you saying that it was employed yeah. well? No, it was employed poorly because they didn't give a shit. But but thinking that something was done badly and thinking that it shouldn't be done at all, it's a bit like, you know, well, you, you, you didn't really sort of put the fire out. So next time, just don't bother at all. Let them all burn. Yeah. Like, it's it's ridiculous. Like And so that absolutely, that nuance was completely lost on people and, and is a lot of the time in, in conspiracism. The idea that basically you don't have to necessarily agree with something or something could be done badly or something could be done um you know with that was a good idea at the start but then c circumstances changed or whatever but this you have to come from a perspective that everything is a plot and everything is organized and so you have to ascribe motive to everything and if you've got that lack of trust like brent was saying then the motivation that you ascribe to everything is nefarious and malicious uh, and that's where it gets properly properly dangerous where basically you, you you've gone past the point of of being curious and suspicious of systems and institutions and people in power to the point where you reject anything that comes through the mainstream, uh, by which I mean, like, you know, literally, if it's on the news, then, then there's, it's not true. The opposite is true. And they yeah. must, and that's, and that's what people do. It's like, well, it says on the news that, that for example, I don't know, you can pick anything. It says on the news that Prince, that, that King Charles is in, in a uh, hospital at uh, the minute. And so everybody's going, well, he's obviously not. So what's going on? And yeah. I've heard everything from he's dead to they're about to abolish the monarchy um, to he's having experimental um, sort of, you know, he's going to six billion dollar man sort of stuff. Like, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it gets very silly. Now, I have one question that I will ask that someone asked me to ask you guys. Yeah, yeah. And that would be, of all the different conspiracy theorist people, who do you think is the most cooked? Oh, God. Um, right. 
Oh, when you when say cooked, do you mean do you mean like who actually pilled properly? Actually, does properly believe what you're talking about? Does believe it? I agree. Not Alex Jones. It's you know, it's a business for Alex. But someone you mean the, the, the most insane. Because if you go for the most insane, it's probably someone like like a Santos Minacci or, or an Ed, oh, wow. Ed, Ed. Like, do you know what I mean? Like he's a he's a vile character who's, who's yeah. in like you know a very very tiny echo chamber of his own creation. Um, so yeah, uh, but but this is the thing because of that, I think that he doesn't appeal to a, a, a particularly broad audience because he is so clearly off his shit. Yeah, very much. I'm going to go... Because um, we got to like, think about who actually believes what they're talking about. Then the, the first person that came to my mind was James Dellingpole. Oh, yeah. A oh, good one. Yeah, yeah, he's gone. The loony, other than poor sort. Yeah. Like, he, he, like James Dellingpole, just so people understand, was, a, a, you know, a once... Respectable is not the right word, but, but <laughs> like, he, he was... Uh, in, he was a journalist, uh, and he, I think he's written for, for things like The Telegraph. He certainly was Spectator. Was he editor-in-chief of The Spectator or something like that? So, you know, he was knocking around in that sort of right-wing press-type thing. And then he became convinced of, of all of the New World Order. So we were watching an interview with him the uh, other day and um, uh, with Richard D. Horble. And um, if well, I was brutally honest, we put it when I put it on, I was like, "Oh, this will be interesting because I'm, I'm sure you'll get lots of pushback." Not one bit of it. James Jelling Cole, oh. like, like, et, like he bought the um, bought the crisis actor thing. Uh, understood that that it has happened in, in other places, like um, oh, um, the marathon bombing, Boston uh, bombing, yep. stuff like that. You were saying that this was all fake and other things were fake and stuff like that, and. And he believed it. You could see he genuinely, genuinely believed it. Wow. Yeah. But but it just goes to show that basically, like, you know, um, he, he's an intelligent, I think yeah. he went to somewhere like Oxford or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's he's a very intelligent, very successful uh, man who comes from, uh, who, who knocks around in circles where basically, you know, serious journalists and serious people mm-hmm. knock about in. And, and he's still gone down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Do you want to know who my probably. favorite my favorite for leave are in everything? Yeah. <laughs> Is Eddie Bravo. Oh yeah. Ah uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> everything like it doesn't matter what it is. I love listening. I remember once watching a three-hour Joe Rogan with Eddie and Alex. Jesus. Yeah, I Bravo. think I've seen that one. <laughs> It was unbelievable. I think I saw that. <laughs> I think you mentioned that. It's on Knowledge Fight. Uh, it was an old episode. They were talking about they got hold of um, some of Alex Dennis's texts off the back of the, the trial. And um, he's basically, <laughs> Eddie Bravo is messaging him saying, when are you going to start about flat earth? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And and he's saying to Eddie Bravo, you know what? I've looked at it, and and I can't I can't deny it. I think you're onto something, Eddie. Yeah, we'll definitely get you on the show. And and then he messages somebody like Roger Stone or Mike Cernovich or something like that, and it's like, how the hell do we get rid of Eddie Bravo <laughs> talking about all this flat Earth shit? Like, <laughs> just, I love so, Eddie Bravo. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. thank you so much, and I'm sure everyone who's on this already listens to your podcast but if people don't listen to your podcast we strongly like i love a new episode i think the way that you guys do run your deep dives is magnificent like i think the pizzagate one and the chemtrails one as well but pizzagate for me was exquisite and i think that if people want to understand how people can believe this stuff you have to go down that journey of opening your mind to everything that they've heard. Because I'll be honest, when I got to episode four of Pizzagate, I'm like, shit, they're on to something. (laughs) 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 That that almost happened with Joel whilst we were doing it as well. We just kind of convinced him halfway through. (laughs) But uh, but yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, that's very very kind of you. But the, but that that is what we hope to do as well is to basically give the conspiracy a fair go 
for a number of reasons. Yeah. One, because basically, like, if you don't, like, you know, somebody, it, it, they're almost like the sort of Black Knight in um, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's like, I've had your arm off. It's like, yeah, but I can still <laughs> keep going. So you've got to take all the limbs off before they even start to go, all right, maybe we should look at this. Um, and um, so, yeah, thank you very much for that. That's very kind of you. So yeah, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you to you guys for giving up your time for us. And thanks to everyone for listening. And make sure you're following Some Dare Call It Conspiracy. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your sleep. Enjoy your day if you're joining us from the UK. And take care. Excellent. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Next week, we'll be releasing our chat with Rupert Reed, the director of Climate Majority Project and former spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. If you don't want to wait a week for that, then head on over to patreon.com slash conspiracy and listen to the early release. Thanks for listening. <laughs>